Good morning. This is Dr. Eric Bricker, and thank you for watching A Healthcare Z. Today's topic is the corporate director of benefits, the most important role in employer sponsored healthcare. Now, if we can do a quick audio video check for all of you watching on LinkedIn and YouTube. So if you could put in the uh, comment section of your respective platforms, if you can see and hear me okay, that would be fantastic. And as many of you already know me, um, some of you don't. And so for those of you who don't know me, let me just do a brief introduction of myself. While I'm introducing myself, if you could also type in the comments where you're viewing from, that would be great. I would, I love seeing where everybody is from. And then if you could also click the like on either LinkedIn or YouTube, if you like my content, that would be super as well. So thank you for doing that. Now, I am Dr. Eric Bricker, um, and I used to be a hospital finance consultant before going to medical school. And then I went on to uh, medical school at the University of Illinois in Chicago, then did my residency in internal medicine at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. And worked as a hospitalist physician, as an internist just in the hospital at the Baylor Scott and White uh, Medical Center in Plano, which is a suburb of Dallas, Texas. I then um, went on to found a healthcare navigation firm called Compass Professional Health Services, where we helped people navigate their health insurance and the U.S. healthcare system and their doctors and the hospitals and their bills, et cetera. And we did that for over 2,000 employer clients, about 1.8 million people. And we in 20, and that was from 2007 to 2018. We subsequently sold that business to Alight Solutions in, um, in 2018. And then because I was working so much with um, the heads of HR and the director of benefits that we're going to talk about today and CFOs and CEOs and the, um, the benefits consultants and brokers. And there was still a fair amount of, of, of confusion around how the U.S. healthcare system worked. So I'm like, hey, let me talk about healthcare finance uh, and create this A Healthcare Z um, series of videos. And so many of you watch them. I've got a, U a Healthcare Z YouTube channel. You watch them on LinkedIn. So thank you so much. Uh, for watching all of these. And then let me briefly look here at where everybody is uh, dialing in from, from the Twin Cities and Madison, Wisconsin and Atlanta and the Jersey Shore. I'm sure it's a beautiful time of year to be there. Um, Ohio, Connecticut, Kentucky, Colorado. Thank you for getting up early in Colorado. Uh, right here in Dallas where I'm located. Fantastic. Um, Georgia, let's see, we got a whole bunch of places, Maryland. Um, awesome. Listen, thank you so much for being here all the way from and our, our award for the farthest away today is Zurich, Switzerland. Thank you so much for being here from Switzerland. Uh, and with that, let's go on to today's topic. So today's topic about the head of benefits it come, was inspired by this podcast. So there's a podcast that's relatively new that's called Broken Benefits that's by Lee Lewis. And that's Lee's picture there um, on the left. And he interviewed Brian Marcotte. And it was a fantastic, and Brian Marcotte used to be the head of benefits at Honeywell, one of the uh, bastions of uh, industrial corporations here in America. And it made me think it is super important. To, if we're going to bring change to healthcare in America, change for good, obviously, in terms of improving quality and lowering costs and improving access to care, and even improving the working conditions for doctors and nurses and other healthcare professionals, that really for employer-sponsored plans, which is the largest source of healthcare financing in America, uh, I shouldn't say that, it's it's the, it's the source of, of insurance coverage for the most Americans, then we need to understand the most important important person of all of employer sponsored health plans which is the director or the head of benefits and this and i highly encourage you to go to this broken benefits podcast you can see it on youtube or you can get it wherever you get podcasts brian Morcote is a benefits savant I mean, when I was listening to this, it, he brought so much positive change to Honeywell. And when, as I was listening to this, it made me realize how central the head of benefits role is. And let me tell you a little bit about uh, Brian Marcotte. So 
not only was he the head of benefits at Honeywell for like 20 years, but he then went on to be the CEO and president of the Business Group on Health in Washington, D.C. for quite a few years after that. So he's really sort of a central figure in benefits in America. Now, at Honeywell, he ran the plan for 150,000 employees, and their plan spend was $500 million a year. It was half a billion dollars a year. And he kept trend flat for seven years at a time when like the healthcare inflation for employers was like at its highest. So when inflation for healthcare spending was at its highest, he kept Honeywell's spend flat. How in the world did he do that? Because he was an expert in navigating the bureaucracy within his own organization. He was a, he set a goal. He had specific high-level strategic goals and tactical goals that he wanted to accomplish. And then he was able to adroitly up-manage the executive team at Honeywell. He was able to build a coalition and he was able to implement change. And this whole podcast with Lee Lewis talks about in detail how exactly he did that. I mean, it is like a blueprint for how to bring positive change to an employee health plan. It is fantastic. And so that really brings me to the central thesis for today's discussion, which is the head of benefits is the linchpin for change in employer-sponsored health plans. If you don't have the head of benefits on board, it is not going to happen. And I'll give you a specific example of that up front. So Haven, right, with Berkshire Hathaway and Chase and Amazon, they were going to go in and they were going to, quote unquote, fix healthcare, but they came from outside of the head of benefits. They came from outside of benefits and they sort of, you know, came in through the CEO and the CFO of these large organizations and they tried to dictate to the head of benefits and it didn't work. And so essentially, and, and Atul Gawande, who was the head of Haven, he even said in an interview, sort of a post-mortem of Haven, he's like, what killed Haven was, we just couldn't get through the corporate bureaucracies of these places. And it's because they tried to change the healthcare of these organizations without having the linchpin, the head of benefits on board. So woe to you if you try to do that. But man, if there is a head of benefits who like, is like Brian and is laser focused on positive change for good, then that's where it happens. So we're going to talk about those people today. If we want to bring positive change to healthcare, then we need to understand the head of benefits in huge detail. Now, as I'm talking about this as well, please put your questions and comments uh, in the, the comment section of LinkedIn or YouTube as well. And I'll um, try to answer them throughout and at the end as well. And if I don't have time to answer all of them, then I'll answer them in writing afterwards. So please put your questions in there. Okay, so first up, we have to understand the role of benefits within the overall corporate structure. And this talk is specifically about corporate benefits for like large corporations in America. So for very, um, you know, oftentimes there's just lots of layers of management. They're very hierarchical. They have to be. Um, now, we're, let's just say 5,000 employees plus is what we're talking here. So at these organizations, you typically have uh, an HR department that has a VP of HR. And then you can see the head of benefits is also oftentimes the head of compensation. So they're the head of compensation and benefits. Sometimes it's referred to as the VP or the director of total rewards. And then obviously you also have recruiting within HR. You have an HR director that does a lot of the administrative HR tasks. It might be about payroll or employee onboarding, or if you have to, you know, dismiss people, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's often, sometimes there's even a learning and development director as well. And then each of these direct reports to the VP of HR, they then have a staff or a team underneath them. Now, the goal of compensation and benefits from like a corporate perspective, from like the CEO's perspective, is to attract and retain employees. That is their goal, right? So keep in mind, they have compensation, which is to attract and retain employees, and they have benefits, which is to attract and re retain employees. So I would argue from like a CEO or a corporate perspective, it's not necessarily to quote unquote, keep people healthy. It's that in order for a company to function, it needs to have great people. I mean, any great CEO 
knows that the key to success is your people. Without your people, you're nothing. And if you can attract and retain great people, you will have a great business. And if you cannot attract and retain great people, you will not have a great business. So strategically, that is the central role of benefits and comp for people who are outside of HR, right? So for the CEO and the CFO, that's their main goal. So it's super important to understand that, all right? Now, let's go on. Now, what I've done now is I've, at Compass, because we had 2,000 employer clients, I worked with a ton of different heads of benefits. So I got to see the full spectrum of what the different heads of benefits are like. And I saw some commonalities and I saw some differences. So what I wanted to do is specifically profile some heads of benefits who were hugely successful in their role and who were also at large corporations. So I'm going to say more than 5,000 employees. Part of the reason why I'm focusing on larger employers is because it stratifies, right? So the majority of employees in America are actually on self-funded plans and self-funded plans have more, more flexibility and self-funded plans at larger corporations also have more internal expertise. So that head of benefits is also going to have a whole team underneath them with benefits managers and benefits specialists. So there's a lot more benefits acumen and bandwidth within corporate HR, you know, 5,000 employee plus HR departments. And so because they have They've got budget and they've got sophistication and they have power and they have such a huge role for such a large number of people in America that are on self-funded plans, which is the, the majority of employees on self-funded uh, and, uh, and employer-sponsored plans are on self-funded plans. Then we need to look at these case studies of these real benefits, superstars, and let's look at their qualities. So Profile number one is for was the head of benefits at a 36,000 employee restaurant chain. Now, interestingly, one of the first things she said when I met with her for the first time was, I love benefits. I mean, she was totally passionate about her job. You don't go into a benefits department very often and hear people say that they love benefits, but she totally loved benefits. So she had passion. Now, I'll, I'll just briefly say as an aside that Aristotle in ancient Greece said, where your passion and the needs of the world meet, there lies your vocation. So you can be passionate about like water skiing, but it's going to be super hard <laughs> because the world doesn't really value your water skiing right? So if you have a passion about something that the world finds valuable, then that's your job. That's your vocation. That's your career. And that was totally the case for this woman. Now, she had 30 plus years of corporate benefits experience. She was hugely experienced when, uh, uh, in her job by the time I met for her. She set forth the strategy for benefits internally. So she drove it. She's like, this is what we're going to do, and this is how we're going to do it. Now, did she rely on input from the other parts of the company? Absolutely. From the financial aspects of the company, from the people side of the business, et cetera. Of course she did. Now, did she also keep in mind the... Uh, input from her consultants, because of course she had a benefit consultant, of course, but she drove the decision, okay? And that is very different. So my point is, is that she was very proactive, right? She knew, it's like Michael Jordan at the end of the game. He's like, I want the ball. Like she wanted the ball, okay? Now, she was also very much into the weeds, it did not bother her to get into the details. And as we all know, the devil uh, is in the details, right? Things, implementations and success live or die in the details, especially at large corporations where there's a lot of bureaucracy. So she personally, for the, the change that she put in place, which was she was very early on in doing a, a full replacement um, consumer-directed health plan, CDHP. And she personally went out 
all over the country to meet with the employees and the, the restaurant managers. I mean, this play, this uh, restaurant chain is literally in all 50 states. So she didn't go to all 50, but she went to a lot of them. So she sometimes um, people in, 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 in corporate, in headquarters, they're sort of, they have a little bit of an academic um, approach ivory tower. Well, I don't want to get into the weeds. I'll just delegate this to other people. I mean, she had a team, but she led from the front, right? She was out there meeting with the employees and she implemented a floor replacement consumer drug and health plan with a very generous health reimbursement arrangement uh, in 2010. So for her to do full replacement CDHP in 2010 was very much ahead of her peers. She saved her employer, her employer lowered their health care spend by 25%. And after that, it only the trend was only like at one or two percent after that. I mean, it was unreal. She was a financial hero within her organizations, and the employees like fully ad adopted and fully like embraced the consumer directed health plan model. They didn't have to rip it out. Other companies, they put in full replacement health plans. The implementation was so bad that the employees revolted and the head of benefits and the head of HR were fired. That happened at multiple other companies that I'm familiar with, not at this company. Hugely successful. Okay, next up. Profile number two is uh, the head of benefits at a 5,000 employee retailer. Now, interestingly, she had less years of experience. She only had seven years of experience, but they had been at this same corporation. So she had really worked her way up the ranks. Now, this woman here at in profile number one, she had spent a long time at a very large well-known corporation and had, had somewhat recently moved over to the restaurant chain. So she had tons of industry experience, but she wasn't necessarily a long timer in that corporation. Whereas at this retailer, she had she had really worked her way up the ranks. And she, but when I met her, she was relatively new to her, her head of benefits role. She was really a go-getter, right? She was pretty young. She was in her early to mid-30s. And she was in a, I would argue for HR, a very senior position for somebody of her age. Because she was a real go a, a real go getter. Again, she was very proactive, very similar to profile number one. Now, I would say something that was really unique and special about her. She was incredibly articulate, one of the most articulate HR leaders that I have ever met. She was also incredibly rational. Like talking to her was like talking to a software programmer. Like I always, always love talking to software programmers because they're incredibly rational. And I would say it was almost like an attorney. She would like set up the facts of the case, not like an attorney, like in a bad way, but like Perry Mason sort of a way where she would very logically bring the jury. In this case, the jury was the CEO and the CFO and the rest of the employees and the team that reported to her. She would very methodically walk them through the rationale for why and how she wanted to do things. And it was hugely effective in building a case for change that, let me see if I can expand it here, that was able to then put in Again, this all happened in like between 2010 and 2013. So this was when consumer directed health plans were, just, you know, sort of in their still in their nascency of being um, being implemented. And she was able to, again, successfully put in the consumer directed health plan along with Compass as their navigation service. And it was hugely successful. And what was interesting is that she continued to prove her case with data from the health plan and from Compass in conjunction with case studies of obviously de-identified case studies, but individual case studies of employees who were able to get higher quality care and more cost-effective care so that it wasn't just like she proved her case to the executive team. They, you know, they gave her the go ahead for what she wanted to do strategically, but then she continued to prove her case in a very rational manner to them uh, going forward.
Next up, profile number three. This is at an 18,000 employee property management company. Now they're the head of benefits, had 20 plus years of corporate experience. Again, very, um, um, very tenured uh, woman in her uh, mid forties. She had, had worked her way up the corporate ladder within benefits across multiple organizations, including like a Fortune 10 organization, which what does that mean? She had gobs of experience navigating bureaucracy. So she had lived large corporate bureaucracy for 20 years. OK, and again, she similar to number one, she was new to that role at this property management firm. So she'd been hired away from this Fortune 10 company to the property management firm. And she'd essentially gotten a promote, you know, she got a higher position being the head. Not only was she the head of total awards for this company, but it was global. She was globally the head. So she was up overnight having calls with Asia all the time. Okay, this woman was so incredibly polished. It was unbelievable. Um, and she, I mean, she was a strategic thinker and she would work a meeting like a fine conductor. I'm sure many of you have been in meetings where you're not running the meeting, but the other person is running the meeting. And you're like, this person is like a, a conductor of a symphony. It's like woodwinds come in, brass come in, strings come in. She was able to gather the input from multiple different people, but it wasn't analysis paralysis. She made people feel like they were heard and she were understood. And she would build consensus. But she would also make decisions in this all in the same meeting. And the meeting only lasted like an hour. This wasn't some sort of 90-minute session. And she would actually make decisions. And then with her, the people in the room, she would map out the plan of action for those decisions. And the way that she did this, I'm going to call the Goldilocks approach because there was not too much detail because you can really get bogged down in the detail, right? Some people in the meeting get really bogged down in the detail. And then there's other people in the meeting whose eyes glaze over, like, like the CFO is like, I don't know how much is this going to cost? Like, I don't really, I don't really, I don't really need to know like how you're going to do this. Um, but so she was able to balance not too much detail and not too little detail. And that all in the same meeting. And that is super hard to do. And she was an expert at it. It was, like I said, it was awesome to watch. Okay, next up, profile number four is at a 10,000 employee, again, retail. This woman was actually the VP of HR, but she had risen out of being the director of comp and benefits. Now, she had been at this organization for a long time. She had a 20 plus year um, corporate benefits, excuse me, corporate HR history. So going back to like her first job out of college and, but the, the current 10,000 employee retailer where she was, um, was she'd been there for 14 years. So she had a lot of experience, a lot of tenure there. And she was really a, she was really a doer and she understood. So she's like, again, she drove the decision-making. She wasn't passive. She was very proactive and she was really able to expertly read the executive tea leaves, right? Because Again, because executives are so busy and they have so many different priorities. Again, between finance and between, you know, when she was the head of benefits, between the VP of HR and the people priorities and, you know, all the different areas. The company that she worked for actually had a private equity firm. So she also had to read the tea leaves of the private equity execs as well. And then she was able to really persuade by consensus. She really made everybody feel like they were listened to but at the same time, she was able to drive decision making and push things forward. So really, what are all these people? These are all ninjas of corporate bureaucracy. The commonality across all of these highly successful individuals is that they were one, they were proactive, they were not passive. Two, they were excellent communicators. We do not live in a bubble. We have to be able to communicate our vision and our strategy, but also the tactics as well. So you have, people are not mind readers. So you have to be an excellent communicator. Then thirdly, they were persuasive. If you're going to lead, you have to persuade people. And to persuade, it requires credibility it requires consensus building, and it requires being rational. And again, this goes to the ancient Greek approach of persuasion of 
ethos, which is credibility, pathos, which is empathizing with those you are wanting to persuade, and then finally logos, which is the logic. And it goes in that order. You don't use logic first, you use your credibility first. All of these people intricately understood healthcare. They could talk the talk, right? So a lot of them had a lot of experience, but that woman who only had seven years of experience, she could talk the talk. She knew very well at a, at a, at a junior level in her, uh, or I should say at a relatively low number of years of experience, she knew how doctors and hospitals operated. She knew how the insurance carriers operated. She knew how claims operated. She knew how the network worked. She knew how discounts worked. So they had credibility because they knew a lot about their job. They were highly competent. Okay. Then two, again, they were great at building consensus. You can't roughshod this. Now you're going to have opposition. Anytime you're trying to build consensus, you're going to have opposition, but they were able to work through that opposition and make everybody feel hurt. And then lastly, they were able to be rational and logical. And, and use data and use stories and anecdotes. And anecdotes. It's not one or the other. It's a combination of data and stories that is the key to the beat to being rational and the logic. Okay. Now, then there's the opposite of these people. There are a lot of heads of benefits that I have worked with that are the opposite of these ninjas, and I will call them the others. And so, just like the opposite of the ninjas, the others are rather timid. I've I would I have seen gobs of timid heads of benefits. They're friendly, but you need to watch out because they tend to be passive aggressive. Next, they're quiet. So what's the opposite of being a good communicator? It's not being a bad communicator, it's being a non-communicator. These people were really non-communicators. You really didn't know what they were thinking because they didn't say a whole lot. And so anytime you're meeting with a head of benefits and they are just really quiet, that is a signal that they might be an other and not a ninja. And then they were not persuasive. They had low credibility because as you would talk to them, you would find out they actually didn't know a lot about how health insurance worked. And they didn't know a lot about health care worked. So they didn't have a lot of credibility because they didn't have a lot of knowledge. They were not a rapport builder. Okay. So yes, they were friendly in a superficial way, but they they really, and again, part of it is because in order to build rapport, you got to talk. And so yes, they were very polite, but in order to build rapport, you can't be quiet. And so really these rapport builders, they were, they were again, they were proactive in building relationships with others within their organizations. And lastly, the others, instead of being rational, they tend to not speak in specifics. They tend to speak in a lot of generalities. So again, they didn't have ethos, they didn't have pathos, and they didn't have logos. Uh, so in other words, what do I mean by speaking, not speaking specifics? They would use a lot of, of uh, corporate uh, jargon, right? We all know corporate jargon, circle back, outside the box, blah, 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 right? The others would speak that way, but the ninjas would not. So the benefits, in, the benefits ninja is the internal champion for positive change. Now, if any of you have gone to business school, you know about the four P's of a successful business. And those four P's are the product, the price, the placement, and the promotion. And so if you are a broker benefits consultant, if you're a health insurance carrier, if you're a, a vendor at like Compass Professional, whatever other type, then you know that these are the four P's that you need to, the four need to thread. Now, the promotion as the internal champion is what the head of benefits does. So you might have a great product. It might be at a great price. The placement is the distribution out to those heads of benefits. It's getting to those heads of benefits. But unless you get the promotion of the head of benefit as a champion within their large organization, you're host. You're dead in the water, okay? Because the head of benefits is the internal promoter. Now, this is the Miller-Hyman approach to sales, but, but all these benefits intuitively 
or objectively knew this. They know that within their organization, there is a technical buyer, there is a use buyer or a user buyer, and there is an economic buyer. Now, the technical buyer is the person that's going to run the day-to-day -day of the health insurance plan. So it's going to be their own benefits team. It's going to be the benefits manager. It's going to be the benefit analysts. And so they need to bring them on board. The use buyer is the people. And you can't, the employees and their family members. And so you can't go out and literally talk to every single employee. But really, the VP of HR is the person whose job it is. Because remember, the, their, their job is to attract and retain the employees. And so the use buyer is the attract and retain buyer. And they were able to then address the, the concerns and the needs of the use buyer. And then finally, there's the economic buyer. We don't have unlimited resources. We don't have an unlimited budget. The economic buyer is the CEO and the CFO. How much of this is going to cost? How much is this going to cost? You go to any healthcare conference um, and all the vendors are like lower healthcare costs, lower healthcare costs, lower healthcare costs, lower healthcare costs. And your solution can't just be that. It has to also address the technical buyer. It's got to be easy to implement. And it also, the employees have to love it. You have to have all three. Okay. If it's just lower healthcare costs, lower healthcare costs, lower healthcare costs, it will not work because you have to allow the head of benefits to address the needs with your solution to each of these three constituents within their organization. Now, what are my final take-home points for today? You need to find the employee benefits ninjas. And you can do that for a, through a variety of fashion, through seeds, nets, and spears. So Aaron Ross, who wrote the book Predictable Revenue, goes into detail about seeds, nets, and spears. Seeds are your personal connections. So you need to be networking constantly, connecting with people on LinkedIn. Your nets is your inbound marketing. So you might do emails, you might do cold calls, you might do, um, excuse me, emails and cold calls or spears. You might do like webinars, you might post out case studies, you might do PR to get into publications like uh, Employee Benefit News, et cetera, so that people find you, that's a net. And then your spear is when you're specifically going after folks. So this is when you're you're doing um, LinkedIn messaging. This is when you're uh, emailing people. This is when you're cold calling people to directly get in front of them. So if you are at a broker benefit consultant or if you're at a carrier or if you're at a vendor, like you, if you don't find the ninjas, you will not be successful. If you want to bring, specifically if you're wanting to bring positive change, like if you're a constituent that's just promoting the status quo, you don't necessarily need to do this, okay? But the vast majority of you that are on this call, like you're looking to bring positive change to the employer-sponsored healthcare space. And so like you got to find the ninjas. Now, when you do, you will encounter the others because there's no sign on their head that says I'm a ninja, okay? So while you meet with these people, you'll find the others. Okay, you need to move on quickly, Okay. Self-deception regarding the others is a is very common with salespeople. Salespeople are like, "Oh, I had a great meeting," but you know, I, I manage sales teams. But then I would, I myself would meet with their head of benefits, and I'm like, "They're a total other. This will never work. You got to move on." Which is why lead generation is so important because you're going to meet a lot of others, and instead, instead of hoping and praying that it's going to work with the other, you just got to move on to the next. Okay, then. Change, again, this goes back to the beginning. Change, oh yeah, so Nagaraj asked for the name of the book. Again, it is Predictable Revenue by Aaron Ross, R-O-S-S. -S. Now, this, this is the, this is the take-home punchline here, okay? Change for the improvement of better employee health, decreased suffering, and greater longevity for 60% of Americans that get their health insurance through an employer-sponsored plan hinges on the director of benefits. I would argue that the director of benefits is more important to health, decreased suffering, and longevity than doctors, than hospitals, than anyone else. And so like no pressure, but then you, if you're the head of benefits, you're just so important to people's lives. And 
these people that I have highlighted in this presentation, I mean, they're, we worked with their employees. We saw this happen. We caught cancers early, breast cancer, prostate cancer, colon cancer, because of the way that these heads of benefits worked. It wasn't us. It was them. We caught heart disease early. We had people, I had a guy come up to me and said, you know, after putting in, you know, Compass and you working with, with me, et cetera, et cetera, he lost 50 pounds. He went from 240 to 190. It changed his life. And again, it wasn't me. It was because the head of benefits was able to bring about change within their organization. So thank you all so much for watching. Let me get to your questions here uh, very briefly here at the end because we are uh, running a little low of time. Okay. Um, our nonprofit um, passion is the, needs to meet the world universe of interactive literacy, life skills, use some of those. Okay. How do you think they discovered their instruments of change? Direct solicitations, broker interactions, industry journal case study. Okay, great question, Lee. Um, how do you think they discovered their instrument of change? Okay, because I, I would put that into the first category of being proactive. They knew that part of their job was to not be passive and let the solutions come to them, but to constantly be seeking solutions, right? Like the good book says, seek and you shall find. They were seekers. So that's why nets are an effective way. Because if you're putting out fantastic content, then they will find you, okay? Because they're seekers. Great question. Let me go here to another question um, that you have. Thank you for being patient with me as I look through these. Um, question here, uh, on average, what percentage of a business revenue is dedicated to employee benefits and healthcare? It's a great question. So at, an, at a company, it's about $10,000 per employee on the plan per year. It's gone up for some, now it's highly variable. For some employers, it's 8,000. For some employers, it's close to 20,000. Okay, so it's it's all over the map. But let's just use the nice round number of 10,000. So that means for every 100 employees, it's a million dollars. So for a thousand employee company, they're spending $10 million a year. Now, what percentage of that, what is that as a percentage of revenue? It depends because business, some businesses with a thousand employees are very high margin businesses. And that uh, $10 million is a very low percentage of their revenue. Likewise, there's other businesses that are very low margin businesses where that $10 million for a thousand person company is a very high percentage of their revenue. But you can use that $10,000 per, somebody says, you don't need to ever ask a company what their healthcare spend is because you can sort of um, make an approximation of it by just asking them approximately how many employees are on your health plan. And that, and then you just multiply that by 10,000 per year and that gives you a, a rough estimate of what it is. Okay, so with that, I will bring it to a close. Thank you for your questions. If there's others that I've missed, I will um, answer them in writing afterwards. So thank you for asking them. Connect with me on LinkedIn if you haven't already. If you would like a copy of today's slides, email me at ericb at ahealthcarez.com and I would be happy to send you a copy of these slides. I also have a video email newsletter that if you go to ahealthcarez.com, go to my website, the very first link at the top is to subscribe to my newsletter. And I mean, I have some of the biggest people, I won't reveal their names, but I have the heads of benefits at huge corporations are on this email list. I have the heads of benefits consulting at huge consulting firms and brokerages across America are on this thing as well. I have a People very high up in academia and research are on this. I have health insurance executives. I have a ton of health insurance executives that are subscribed to this as well. So with that, I just want to say thank you 
for pushing the ball down the field for positive health care change this week. It's a lot of work. It's exhausting. Today is Friday. I hope you have a fantastic Friday and a restful weekend. Bye, everybody.